We've heard Sue talking to us about real estate, and that's very important. Of course, there are all the corporate moguls you know, Kyle Mutoko, Nora Dresso, and that's where women have concentrated, in the private sector. But I want to persuade you that it's time for more women to come into the public sector. And I'm going to give you some very good reasons. Early on today, somebody asked me, Joki, you're going to talk to us today about being in the corridors of power. Because that's what it is, really. You know, whether you're in the executive, the judiciary, or parliament, you're walking in the corridors of power. And somebody asked me this morning, how did you get there? What was your journey to getting there? And I thought to myself, there's no real formula actually. If I think back in my own life, actually I had a very adventurous kind of life. You know, my working life, if you look at it, is full of experiments, sort of going in a particular direction. I knew, though, that I had a gut conviction here, deep down in my gut, that I had to do something for women. And that came from my history as a young girl. I was first born in a family, and I come from what would be called a very privileged background in Kenya. I grew up in Karen. My parents moved there in 1969 when it was still a forest, <laughs> and we had neighbors. On this side was uh, Lady Harrigan, <laughs> and on the other side was Lady Twining. <laughs> and there were no black Africans for miles. And we lived in Karen. And everyone says, oh, you lived in Karen. You must have had a really good life. But actually, there was domestic violence, and a lot of it, in our house. And often, my father would come home, having drank a substantial amount of alcohol. He would come very violently. In fact, we never used to sleep until my dad came home. Because the way he drove his car, we would be able to know whether he has drank or not drank. If he comes with his uh, car revving, then we had a plan, all of us. The younger uh, kids would go into one bedroom. I would go to my mom's bedroom and make sure that the keys are not in the lock so that my dad cannot lock her in the bedroom. And then we would not sleep until first he came in, he would eat, and then he would decide whether or not he is going to beat my mom. And then we'd have to run out so that we can prevent him. And, you know, it was just a constant cycle. Many times we were all thrown out of the house. And my mom used to keep cows. So we used to go and sleep with the cows. So actually, we got to a stage where we'd even put blankets. There's a place. Because you knew that it could happen so that we could have blankets and my mom would put milk and then in the morning, we would get up, and the door is opened, and then we go and put on our uniforms to Loretta Convent Musangari and all the post schools and go to school. But something struck me, because living like that in Karen, what was the difference between my mother and her children, and a woman in Kibera, and a woman in Korogosho, and women who have no money, so actually, violence against women cuts through class. There is no poor or rich woman when it comes to these problems. And for me, it's stuck here. So in whatever I did, I said, I thought to myself, I know I need to do something about this problem one day. But that did not prevent me from also having an adventure. Because I also think if you want to build your character, in whichever career path you want, even public sector, you need to grow. And I think you also need to have fun. You know, I don't want you to imagine that women who go into public sector are very serious and they sit looking in their desks, you know. <laughs> very boring characters. You must be adventurous. In fact, I think I've almost tried everything. I've been bungee jumping. I've gone white water rafting. I've done go-karting, for those of you who know who, who, how to do that. In fact, the only thing I haven't done yet is skydiving and safari rally. And I'm still planning to. <laughs> because I think having fun gives you balance. And it also, you then know what, 
where, where you're sort of going, because you need to have that balance in career and outside of your career. However, throughout my career, I've had three principles, three values, and one core conviction, and I want to share that with you. My three principles are as follows, and I think that these are important for a successful career. One, please plan. You don't plan, you don't go anywhere. Each one of you needs to chart your course, and you start early. Some of us now, maybe we haven't start planned as well, but you know, you can't move forward. Like for example, if I thought that I wanted to go into human rights and women's rights, and I figured I needed to do law. It's one of the best ways to, to address what I wanted. So I needed to plan to go to university. Then I needed to plan. So all these things are planning. Nothing sort of comes just on its own. So planning is very important. The other thing, I call these the, my three P's, my three principles. The first is planning. The second thing is passion. Don't ever do something you don't have passion for. If you don't like blood, please don't become a doctor or plan to become one. If you're afraid of heights, piloting is not for you. Do something that you love to do. And please try, I know many of us as women, we, we, we went into careers that we were forced into by our parents. And we hate our jobs. And they're very boring. Get out of it. And it's never too late. Get out of it now. Do something that you feel a conviction for. The third P is to pray. There is nothing possible without Almighty God. It is a deep belief that I have. In all the things I've done in my life, he has been there constantly. Amen. Sometimes I forget to thank, and I'm like, oops, but I make sure. Because in the end, actually, he's the one who decides where you're going, really. Then you have to, in, in these three principles, you temper it with three values. One is self-discipline. You have no self-discipline, you are doomed. Self-discipline in many things, in things that are moral, in things that are professional, unless you're able to tell yourself this is right and this is wrong, then again, I'm afraid you will fail. The other value is that you need to have service to others. It can't be about me, 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 me. Sometimes it has to be about us. And it has to be about we. Help the sister next to you. And your other sister will help you. You know, I like this sister talk. You know, I come from the tribe of women. You know, in Kenya, we like talking about tribes. Mine is the female tribe. <laughs> and I like to do service to others and especially to my sisters. I like the we movement. Thirdly, and this is a value which I, I, I feel is important, is we need to have, we need to use our brain power, not our bottom power. <laughs> the late Professor Wangari Mathai taught me something when I was in Parliament. She even wrote about it in her book. She said the reason why it's so difficult for women to go into politics is because everyone practices neck down politics. They're always looking at what you have from the neck down and not what you have from the neck up. And women who go into politics or into any career, if you think you're going to use neck down, then nothing that you do and nothing that you own will be yours. Your financial, professional, and economic success must come from the neck up. Never from the neck down. You go and buy a beautiful house like Sue, Sue, Sue is telling us here, let it be your money, girl. Yeah. If it's his money, it's not your house. It's not your house. It's not your house. And really take that seriously. I think, you know, a lot of people say, oh, well, you know, sometimes bottom power works. It never works. It never works. Walking the corridors of power. What is political office about? It's about political power. What is power about? Power is about influence and it's about benefits. If you cannot influence, you don't benefit. So it is the people with power who have privilege. And they exercise the privilege while oppressing those who don't have power. Power is about those who have and those who 
do not have. If you look at history, and some of this history still remains true, our history shows us that those people who had power were white, westernized, wealthy, male, healthy, educated. Right on the other side was, if you're black, if you're an African, if you're poor, if you're a person with disabilities, if you're uninformed, and if you're an African female, you're right at the bottom of the barrel. And those are the power dynamics. And those of us who are struggling with women's rights, and we talk about gender equality, we're not actually telling our male counterparts we want the power. We just want to share it. In Kenya, we are familiar with power sharing arrangements. <laughs> so first of all, we demand to share power because it's our right as citizens, and we are 52% of the population. But let me tell you why else we must be in a place of influence and a place where we can benefit. First of all, men and women are equal, but we're different. Whether you talk about menstruation, maternity, menopause, there are things that affect us that do not affect them. And therefore, they cannot make decisions on those things. Similarly, we would not want to, want to make decisions on things that affect them, but don't affect us. And this is a very important thing, because that's why some of our policies are upside down. Just think about it. Look at family planning. Family planning has been crafted so that it is women who take the contraceptives. Yet, when a woman is pregnant, she cannot get pregnant for nine more months. But the man who made her pregnant can make her pregnant every day of those nine months. Who should be on the pill? But then, who then decides who goes on the pill? Because people don't contextualize. I'll give you another example. When I was in parliament, and I hope this does not go on, is it called kukurukakara? <laughs> you know, nowadays I'm a judge. There are some things I'm not supposed to say, but I want to share with my sisters. When I was in parliament, I raised a question about female condoms. My question to the Minister of Health was as follows. Male condoms in this country are subsidized. So it is possible to get a packet of three male condoms for 10 shillings. On the other side, you can only get a packet of three female condoms for 400 shillings. Yet statistics have shown that women are bigger consumers of condoms than men, so they actually buy more male condoms than men. The problem is to negotiate. Because when you use a female condom, you don't have to negotiate. But when you're using a male condom with your partner, you must negotiate for it to be used. And in our rural communities especially, women say there's no electricity. The men come from the village drinking at night. They say to use the female condom is very easy. You just put it, nobody will? No. And therefore, they are able to manage disease control, family planning, without getting into a fight. So it's a very important question. Why is it that the government will subsidize male condoms but not subsidize female condoms? But when I asked the question, you should have had the sniggers. <laughs> <laughs> we are talking about sex. And the assistant minister who gave me an answer explained, he said the reason why we do not subsidize female condoms is because there are more men in Kenya who have sex than women. <laughs> fortunately, 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 order. <laughs> fortunately for me, the speaker was actually sitting in the chair. It was Francis Ole Caparo. And he told the minister, Minister, order. Order. Can the minister tell this house who those men are having sex with? <laughs> but 
the issue is still unresolved. Women condoms are still not being subsidized. Everybody thought it was a joke. And that is the end of that story. I don't know who is following up that. But I'm beginning to show you why we need to be in those houses. The, that's the first reason. The first reason was that we are equal but different. The second reason we need to be in positions of power and influence is that it's our money. Think about it. Each one of you pays tax. To the government of Kenya, how is your tax spent? Each one of you, on your pay slip, pay as you earn. When you buy a kilo of sugar, there is a tax. How is that money being spent? Is it being spent to help you and your children? Or you don't care about how your money is being spent? Really? Because this matters more than you think. Until before 2003, 2004 actually, sanitary tiles in this country used to be taxed heavily. Actually, sanitary tiles were taxed as luxury items. Yes. Actually, we went to treasury. We were shocked. Because what they do, they put every item into a category. So sanitary towels had been put in the same tax, uh, luxury, uh, they call it the luxury item category with Mercedes Benz and all that. <laughs> when we went to ask, why is this the case? In fact, the time I asked was before I was in parliament. I was then a very feisty feeder advocate and we stormed Musalia's office. He was then the minister of finance. Said, why is it that you men are making money off our bodies? In, and as if it's a luxury. And it's not a tap. Every woman has a period. Why are you making this money? And he said, he went and looked and he said, oh my goodness, you know what? We have a special team of 17 experts. They are all men. <laughs> and I hear that when they were discussing the sanitary towels, they said, oh my God, these women's things, this is too embarrassing. Where are tuna perfumes and lipsticks and... And those same, same 17 men zero rated the, the male condoms. If there was a single woman sitting in that team of 17, it would not have happened. So we raised it. And in parliament, me, myself and the other women MPs, we raised it. And the women were so embarrassed. Because for some reason, we let the most conservative into parliament. Did you know that? The very most conservative, the people who say, but women cannot be here, you know. Yeah? <laughs> so when we wanted to raise the issue, they say, you want to talk about what? <laughs> openly. They say openly. We say, but it is a taxation issue. Yes, but you cannot talk about it openly. <laughs> so eventually, we got clever. And these are some of the strategies you learn when you're working in an environment that's so male-oriented, like the public sector. And you now look, because what matters a lot to male leaders is money. If you can show them that there is money involved and they can save money on any one issue that's a woman's issue, they'll listen to you. So what we did in the parliament that I was, there were a lot of polygamous members of parliament. So we looked for the ones who had about three or four wives. <laughs> and with about 12 to 13 daughters. <laughs> and then we went and we said, Ebu calculate. <laughs> Every month, you buy each one of these women in your household a packet of sanitary towels. Multiply that by 12 for the year. Multiply that for the number of years this, uh, uh, this woman or girl will be in your household. So w the first person we saw, I will not mention his name, <laughs> he was so distressed. He said, the government is stealing from me. <laughs> this government. <laughs> Needless to say, Within the next six months, the government zero rated the sanitary towels. But it's very important. It's not, it wasn't just about you and I having to pay a lot more than we need to for something that is necessary. But especially in the poorer areas, 
Girls used to drop out of school, did not used to sit in the, the exams because they cannot go and sit the exams on the day they're having their period. They couldn't afford the sanitary towel. And then what happens in 20 years' time, you find that the workforce of women is much lower because girls did not finish school. So it, it's a whole, it's a big issue. So when I say you need to look after your money, it is bigger than you think. And when I tell you then you need to come into political and public office, it's a good reason. But thirdly, it's about responsible financial management and prudence, as the Treasury Mandarins would tell us. If you read the World Bank studies, they will show you that we spend a lot of money in, in what we call treatment, in emergency treatment, emergency care treatment. If you look at our health budget, a huge part, percentage of that budget goes into emergency care. If you go every weekend, end of month, what are the biggest cases in emergency? No, they're not. The biggest cases are domestic violence cases and sexual violence cases. That's what emergency normally handles. If we could put more money into prevention, if we can have stricter laws, then we save that money and put it into childcare or something else. So also it's about your taxes and how you're managing your taxes. And that's why I want to persuade you to come into public life. It's not easy though, let me assure you. It's not easy at all. In fact, when I first went to parliament, I, I had to develop a thick skin. I, I got a shock of my life, actually. When I first went into parliament, I felt I, as if I was in a secondary school for boys. <laughs> no, do you know that feeling? Huh? You're just a few girls, and then there are all these boys, and there's a lot of testosterone. Eh? Guys are going, ew, ew, ew. You know, as women, we don't operate like that. So, it's, you know, everybody is like, oh my goodness, you know? Very different life. Outside of parliament, it looks different. Inside there, it's amazing. So there's a lot of testosterone. There's also a lot of sexual harassment. Okay? I like to share a story about how me and Cecily Mbarire, we were then the youngest members of parliament. We got stuck, actually, because we had a problem we could not shake the hands of our colleagues. Because initially when we went there, you would shake the hand of a colleague and then... <laughs> you know what I mean. You know what it means. And we, we called it scratching. And we used to call them the scratchers. But what would we do? You are a member of parliament and you are afraid to shake another member of parliament's hand because of sexual harassment? How inappropriate. We had to do something, but what? So in the end, what we did, we devised a strategy. The next time it happened, and we did it somewhere where the members of parliament converge. Then you, you know, I shouted, I said, hey, Cecily, scratch your number seven. <laughs> So what happens is all the other men, they run and say, what's that? What's that? <laughs> oh yeah, this guy, you know, he likes to scratch and he's the seventh guy. First of all, the guy is embarrassed. <laughs> then all the other men who laugh at him are like, I never want to be caught doing that. <laughs> and by the end of the month, there was no more scratching. <laughs> so it was a difficult place. The toilets, there were no toilets for women. We had nowhere to put our handbags. We had only one toilet. We were sharing 18 women when I got there. Um, there was a toilet inside the chamber. And what, what happens in parliament when you're voting? The doors are locked. So you, you own, there's only one toilet in the chamber. If you go to that chamber, it's unisex. So it doesn't matter if it's that time of the month. You're locked in a chamber for three hours because of voting. What can you do? It was the most unfriendly. In fact, the other day I went to see the new chamber to inspect. Now I see it is friendlier. There are enough toilets. There are toilets that I can allow women such facilities. So it's very improved. But that time, it was not. And um, there was... <laughs> anyway, it was a very interesting place to work. But you also had to hone your skills. If you're coming into this life, the public sector, it's a, it's a, it's a man's world. You also have to hone your skills as to negotiating. Negotiating with the other side. 
It can be very challenging. Already I've told you some of the strategies that we have used. But you have to, because if you imagine that these are people who don't experience some of the things we experience. They don't experience, for example, childbirth. And their sense of how, how looking after a small child, they don't understand that that's what women do. So how do you expect them to make policy? How do you make, to make, expect them to make policy if the majority of men are not the ones who are rape victims? So then how do you persuade them? Because persuasion is key. My own experience in the sexual offenses bill was that I had to do a lot of, first of all, background work, statistics, what are the criminal statistics, what are the medical statistics, how much does it cost, because that's always something that men will be interested in. Male leaders look and say, how much are we going to be saving some money? Um, then you have to deal with what we, the, I call male fear, which is very real. And sometimes it's very rational. You've seen it. Huh? Women, they want more seats. Why? Why? What are they coming to do here? <laughs> and it's not something that they think about. And you've seen it even socially. You know, people see women gathering somewhere, they say, what are those women doing there? What are they talking about? <laughs> so how do you address the fear? It's very real. And you know, you have to learn, I think, and I did, how to approach so I did what I needed to do, especially in the sexual offenses bill. For those uh, members of parliament who are older, I used to go and say, Baba, you know? I even bow my, my head. If, if, if they are from Maasai land, you have to be blessed. You talk in low tones. You talk about children. You, you, you make sure you contextualize, because I found that if you use threatening language, it works against what the work you're trying to do. It's the same way. Our mothers tell us that we, we work in our homes. When you want something, what do you do? You don't shout. And this is something that I learned. It was very interesting. But still, I had some very difficult times. Because at the time the bill was coming to the floor of the house, I had a very strong opposition to the bill. And most of the, the, people, the, the members of parliament opposing the bill were doctors, lawyers, professionals. At the same time in South Africa, Zuma had been charged with rape. Across the border here in Uganda, BCJ, the leader of the opposition, had been charged with rape. So everyone said Njoki is now bringing a bill to finish us politically. <laughs> so just dealing with how do you deal? So I engaged in many interesting practices. In parliament we have a bar. So I used to go there every evening for about uh, half an hour, buy drinks, you know, and uh, you'd find, you know, people drinking beer. When I walk in, it becomes whiskey. I say, okay, that's a cost. Of course, after the bill passed, I was looked for. They say, what happened? You stopped coming. <laughs> hmm? But I did everything. I even cried tears. Not deliberately. It wasn't a ploy. But one day I was so frustrated because I thought the bill was going to fail. There was a group that had decided that they were going to make sure. And I'm saying they don't understand how important this is for the women of Kenya. And I was crying, and you can't believe. The rumor went around that I was crying. <laughs> and that I was crying in a toilet. It was not true, but I didn't deny. And then they said, oh, poor le mama. Iki tutu. Tuta petisha. So actually, it's okay to be a woman. And it's also okay to be soft. And it's okay to be emotional. You know, we always told, don't be emotional. Actually, it works. We can be emotional when we feel so passionate. But I want to tell you something. I know the time is not on, my, on our side, so I won't go into much more. But to say this, the women who have walked the path before, those in parliament, those who are working in ministries, those who are now working in the judiciary where I am, are working very hard for other women. And they have left legacies. In the parliament where I was just the other day, look what we achieved. We were able to zero rate taxation on sanitary towels. We were able to pass the Sexual Offenses Act. We were able to get the government to bring in the Women's Fund. Three billion to support women enterprises. We were able to persuade the government to bring in the Youth Fund. Three billion going to young people, half of that fund must go to young women. Yeah. We were able 
to bring the maternity uh, leave and the paternity leave. We were able, and this is something many, many women don't know, we were able to bring changes to the Employment Act that now state that every company has to have a compulsory sexual harassment policy, which they must put up on the wall. So if any of you work somewhere where that policy does not exist, please let me know. Because it is the law so that women can now work free of threats of sexual violence in any way. There is also the Public Officer Ethics Act. The sexual harassment is a crime. It's an offense under the Public Officer Ethics Act. The next time you walk into a public office, and then the public officer tells you, you do me, I do you, report him. <laughs> and then we also manage to, 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 to introduce what we call a gender aspect of political party funding. Before 2007, political parties were not funded by government. They are now. But in, we had to make sure that before government gives political parties money, each of those political parties, in their national executive committees, they have to have one-third women. If they don't have the one-third women, they don't get the money. And a lot of people had ignored it. But then when the deadline came close, I don't know if you remember, at the end of, I think 2008, if I'm not sure, December, all political parties were looking for women because they needed the money. So I hope that I've shared some interesting things with you, including how you tie public money to the issue of women's rights. But just to say this, every woman must leave a legacy. Whether you're in private uh, sector or public sector, you have to ask yourself, what is your legacy? For me, and I, talked, I told Joki Karia this when she interviewed me, I said that on my gravestone, I would like it to be written that I left Kenya a safer place for women. Wow. What about each one of you? Each one of you, please do leave Ke the Kenyan women and yourself. Leave this country with something to be proud of. Thank you. Oh, let's give her a 